Good morning. We will just start. Yeah, this we is will. the infamous. No, I'm. You're not infamous. There's nothing infamous about you. You, you did. You did you're the coach ball game. Everybody knows who you are. Do I call you I'm James? Thinking. Do you prefer to be called James, or is it a secret that your name is James? I always introduce myself as James, but nobody calls me James. My college buddies call me Jimmy Ball Game, and everybody else calls me Coach Ball Game. And everybody else that isn't everybody else calls me ball game. Uh, but I think if I had to put it into a percentage, 95% of people in the world call me ball game. Ball game. Okay. It's weird. I, people call me the bat guy now. And I don't bat like guy. I'm like, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm way more than the bat guy guy. But. Yeah. You're the beard guy. You're the Buffalo guy. Uh, I mean, you, you got a lot more bees. Uh, you're the mullet guy. There's an M in there. <laughs> you, you, you've got a lot more more to offer. Thank you. I do feel like you were a, uh, a, a very um, diverse human. That's what I love about you. Same to All you. Right, so we're we're going to record this little conversation, but I'm 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 honestly calling you for some therapy. I've had I'm, I'm dealing as a parent as a former parent coach and as a now son of high school players and, and, a, and, a, and another younger one coming up I'm calling for therapy so this is a therapy session and my hope is that we're going to find some nuggets of wisdom uh, that we can share with our audiences um, and I just I've always loved what you do and I'm just always wanting to uh, make sure that people know who you are because it's so important. I think at the end of the day, we have a lot of coaches out there that teach the, teach the mechanics, teach the physical, and that's all great and it's certainly necessary. Um, uh, you, gotta learn, you gotta learn the mechanics and all that. You gotta learn the physical, that's why we play. We love to be out and outside and hitting things with sticks and tackling people and we all love that part, but sometimes the mind gets in the way of making that as fun as possible. So I know you're all about fun and I love that you're focusing on the earlier stages of, of these kids' lives and the parents. And I think today what I want to do is, you know, at Warstick, we definitely are about, you know, it's not the weapon, it's the warrior. We, we definitely always help, trying to help the player merge those two things, merge the mind and mechanics, right? So that the mind lets the mechanics come out and so that you can play in this kind of freedom of this, this, this state of joy and freedom, right? Like that's the good stuff, right? Joy and freedom. If you can play in that state, that's really why you play, but it's just baseball's the hardest one to get there in the most often, right? And we do talk about the player a lot, but I want to talk about, I don't want to talk about the player today. I want to talk about the environment that we create for the player as parents, as parent coaches, um, and even I really want to talk about how the coaches themselves create the environment uh, for the players because baseball's hard enough. And I'm just seeing some things as, as a parent who's going through, you know, I'm, I'm going on 10 years and going through watching my son's play youth sports, not just baseball, but youth sports. And especially in baseball, baseball is a good thing to talk about because, again, it's probably the, the one where we see this the most. But I do feel like I see, I don't know if I want to call it a toxic, toxic, toxic environment, but I just feel like when I go to a youth game and I'm not excluding myself here, I am coming for therapy because I'm, I'm asking how do we contribute to creating an environment for these players throughout all age groups that lets them uh, find that flow and that joy and that freedom as much as possible. So it's hard enough. Why are we doing, why are we going to make that any harder on them? But I really want to get into like, how do we do that? Like, like I feel like when I'm at a youth game, it's a roller coaster of emotions. Mom is, you know, maybe mom, dad, they, they kind of have their different ways to do this, but I feel like literally we live and die. We, we, all, we all know that Johnny's not going to get a hit seven out of ten times, and if he does that, he's ecstatic. We, can, we could write that on a sign. doesn't matter. 
each at bat is live or die and each at bat is a guy struck out and I'm, I'm literally depressed physically until something happens on the other thing that's good that gets me on the top of the roller coaster. And then sure enough, there's gonna be another thing and it's just this up and down and up and down. And as, as a recovering perfectionist, I mean, I felt I, that's why I struggle with baseball and probably why I'm forced to exist, which I see as a gift, great. Um, but how do we, how do we, as parents and as coaches too, not, how do we, you know, I, I think we all want our, our kids to do as best they can and to, and to find that freedom and joy, but I think sometimes we contribute to a lot of stress that is just unnecessary. Um, and I just was like, man, I, I want to enjoy this, man. I want to come to a youth game and have fun. Now, I don't mean fun and just the, I, I do, I do love the competitive, you know, I, it is a fun feeling to go out and compete at your highest just feeling. I don't mean just fun for fun's sake, but like, it would be great if we could go to a baseball game and just, it was, it was a great experience. It was fun. It's not something we dread going to because we know that toxicity is, is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if that's a topic, but if you understand what I'm talking about, I'd love to start talking about You've it. set me up nicely. And uh, I, it, there's so much to unpack there, and I'm going to attack it uh, two-pronged. And I'll start with a, uh, an analogy that I heard from a pal. Um, if you want your kid to excel at video games, if you want them to get a college scholarship or uh, make the best video game team, are you going to sit beside them on the couch and micromanage and um, scream and critique every single button they push? And every time they, they fail, are you going to urge them to not fail uh, the next time they push that button? Um, I think, if you tried that for a weekend, kids would um, stop playing video games. Now you throw that into a baseball field. What happens when somebody who's not fully educated on something, um, you know, I played through college, you played uh, pro ball as well. We're pretty educated on the game of baseball, but when you're not fully educated on something and you get in a high leverage situation, uh, what do you do? You get anxious and you yell. Mm -hmm. So uh, I get it. That's why it happens to a parent, to a youth coach from the dugout or the bleachers. Um, it's an anxious moment and you're you haven't really been all the way to the top. So, you know, this feels like uh, it's the most important thing in the world. Um, but when we, when we put winning and um, skill development as the paramount and the, the, the top of the top, um, we're pushing these kids out of the game and we're creating this toxic environment um, of win, win, win at all costs. And if we don't, um, you know, it's going to be a sad four hour car ride home from the five games we played over the weekend. Um, now multiply that kind of pressure and ang anxiety that a parent feels in the bleachers, multiply it by 20. And that's what you got uh, in the brain of a kid who's in the batter's box. Mm -hmm. um, good luck with that kid. Yeah. So over time, and I started out coaching very badly. Uh, in 2005, I was passive aggressive. I was coaching uh -huh. seven-year-olds like they were 18. Mm -hmm. um, I, I even went to my boss and said, I didn't sign up for this. You know, these kids are rolling around in the dirt. They're not having fun. I'm not having fun. They're not turning double plays. They're not winning games. Uh, because that's, that's the, uh, that is the vibe that I was surrounded by. And, you know, coming out of college, uh, you know, even though I'd been there, done that, it took, it was a learning curve of about two or three years for me to, to, for the light bulb to come on and say, you're looking through the wrong lens. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and the lens you're looking through right now is causing these kids to not come back next year. Mm -hmm. And it's a lens that's causing these kids not to become better people. So I had to, I had to really turn that on its head uh, around 2008 and start looking through a different lens, like take those glasses off, put some new ones on and promise myself that every second of practice or a game that I'm coaching, am I making this kid want to come back next year? And am I making this kid a better person? And as I started to look through uh, those glasses, uh, kids started coming back. They were having a lot more fun. They were performing way better. Uh, the parents were starting to slow their roll because they were starting to sense um, from from the coach who is the leader uh, that you know what there there's a there's a problem and we need to fix it and uh, it, it starts with with the kind of energy that you're you're laying out there so there there's one prong the other prong is just a story I I, I always. Uh, go back to uh, early on in my uh, coaching career, probably 2008, 2009, a kid comes up to me and says, coach, uh, you know, we're going to, uh, I want to give baseball one last try. We've had some bad experiences and uh, a lot of pressure, a lot of negativity, but we want to give baseball one last try. I said, okay, how old are you? Five, <laughs> right? Five years old. I was like, man, are you, Benjamin Button, did you start <laughs> on the, I mean, what, tell, talk to me about this. And he's like, uh, yeah, just had some negativity, oh. a lot of pressure, uh, a lot of yelling, um, you know, and, and I, I just see this visual of parents jumping out of the bleachers, yelling at the umpire, coaches hollering negativity from the dugout. And then you just see this kid walking towards camera uh, as he throws his glove on the ground and, and takes his hat off and, and, and just moves on to the next thing, which could be video games or it could be isolation or it could be anything. Um, uh, and that's a step backwards uh, yeah. from, from just playing a game of baseball. So uh, a couple of years later, I had another kid come up to me and say, coach, I got a problem. I'm seven years old. My travel ball coach won't let me play soccer because you have to play baseball year round with this, with this team. And if you miss a, a baseball game, you're off the team. I have a lot of friends on that team and that just crushed me. And that was really the beginning of, of me, not just using this job I have as a, a men's a means to, to, you know, providing for my family. It, it, this was a mission. This is very important. Um, that seven year old needs to be able to hang out with their friends. They need to be able to play baseball. They also need to be able to play soccer and football and basketball and swim and just be a kid. And that was very eye opening to me on this narrative uh, that's seeping into youth sports and it's all sports of you better start taking it real serious early on or you're going to get passed by and I don't think there could be more of a lie out there there's not that that is a lie yeah. uh, Mike Trout's a great outfielder because he was a great basketball player in high school all state basketball uh, Christian Yelich has been quoted to say why is a nine-year-old feeling pressure to win a game right they haven't even fully grown yet uh, they don't have the motor skills yet and they're nine um, wins don't matter till you're on tv um, they just don't. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, as, as I've gathered story upon story upon story upon email, um, down this road, first of all, I get it. I get why you get sucked in youth coaches and, and parents to, um, wanting to create this best life for your child. But, uh, I saw it with one of my best friends growing up when you're pushed as a kid, um, to, be in college. And that's what a lot of kids are doing. They're, they're, they're not being kids. They're just driving in a van for hours and hours and playing seven games over a weekend, winning this trophy. They're being pushed, pushed, pushed six days a week to, to hit the cage or um, uh, work, work, work. And then when they get to college, they're over it. 
mentally and physically they're burnt out they're burnt and out. uh you know they it's just want to be a whole, kid it's been from five to 18 showcasing yeah there's the showcase yeah, and and, and, what, and then when they get there the love and joy and the freedom of the, the, the that would be the way they play best is just kind of it's gone absolutely when they turn 18 and they go to college they just want to be a kid so we we've we've got a long way to go but i have um, made it my life mission to bring back the sandlot. I think if I can, if I can drop bases down in communities all around the country and I can um, uh, flip this, this narrative of elite sports on its head and say, no, uh, where's that 13 year old with blue jeans that's never played baseball. I want, I want him to have a chance to socialize and become a better person and have fun and learn the game of baseball. Um, so I, I, I'm doing 20 a week right now. I'm going to be taking it on the road to, um, Iowa and Chicago and St. Louis and Pittsburgh and New York city, uh, this August, I've done it in your hometown for the world series and many others. But, uh, this message that, uh, you know, baseball should be very fun and, um, transcending baseball, all youth sports should be very, very fun and um and and think big picture um it it's it's the message coming from major league managers major league players college coaches there's this huge uh juxtaposition of um what a youth parent thinks their 12 year old needs the best equipment uh, the most um games played the most private lessons and you know, singular focus, as opposed to um, what Joe Madden and Albert Pujols and Mike Trout and uh, you know Christian Yelich and Cody Bellinger and 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 uh, college coaches all around the country, they want to see a well-rounded athlete when they're 17. Um, that way, uh, if there's not a spot open at second base, they know how to play right field because they've learned a drop step in basketball, or they've learned how to take a read in football as an outside linebacker to be able to get to different uh, positions on a baseball field. Um, let, you know, let the college coaches and the pro coaches um, dial in your child's life. Uh, how about you uh, as far as, as far as a, a, an athlete goes, how about you just dial in your child's um, heart and, 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 and their joy and um, their passion for the game uh, because um, you're going to slowly start to see this burnout happen in 95% of the kids and the other 5%, you know, that, that, uh, that's 5%. And that's, and that's great. That 5% needs travel ball and they need that focus. But I would say Garrett Cole is in that 5% and he would skip July 4th tournaments if it didn't, if it didn't align with his yearly throwing program. So when we can make it more about skill development, more about the player uh, at that elite place and not make it so much about uh, so many games, games, games. I love scrimmages. And when I do a sandlot, it's mostly games, but we've got nicknames. We've got cheering for your teammates. We've got songs that we sing, poetry. There's drums in the on deck circle. Um, there's cards being dished out for kids making good choices. And it feels like a birthday party. There's no pressure from the bleachers or the dugout. Don't strike out. Don't walk this guy. You better win. I mean, come on, that's, it, it never, ever works. So yeah, um, that's my point. It doesn't work, right? It, it, it right. actually should be commonsensical. It does not work. And, and, and my opinion is, do we think that kid meant or tried to make an error as if it's a choice to, to do it? Like no one wants to make an error. And so when you say, don't do that, don't strike out, okay, I, I was thinking I wanted to, but I, I guess I won't. It's, that's not what you're doing. And further, like, if you have a coach that say, you know, maybe the hardest, you know, if, if the pressure's there to be perfect, how the heck are you ever going to play even close to perfect? If, 
if you know, I probably the most intense thing you could probably see on a baseball field from a coach uh, is the old uh, maybe take the kid out in the middle of an inning for playing bad defense humiliation factor. And I'm thinking, what's the end goal here? Um, to send the message that if you're not perfect, I will take you out. And I'm just like, there's, I don't know the mental, most mentally strong person in the world. It would take that person to be able to deal with that and just set it down and move on to the next and come out and play great. Yeah. So, so I, I got to, two, yeah. Like, and that's what I mean by how as coaches and how parents, when a kid fails, because we know they're going to, and the younger they are, the more they're going to do it. And they're going to keep doing it till they're professionals. And maybe professionals are professionals because they're the ones that actually learn better than anybody else to deal with the failure and to put it aside and move to the next thing. That's mostly why they're professionals. They're professional at overcoming failure, especially in baseball. Um, but how do we as parents and coaches um, help our kids deal with that failure and say, hey, you know what? I made an error. Well, why? Well, is it a, can we see it as a learning opportunity to say, well, you know what? I sat back on the ball too much here. It's just subjective. It's not that I'm a bad player and I didn't try or something like that, which is what comes out of the parent's mouth a lot. Like, oh my God. Absolutely. Like said, it matters. It's like a... It, you know, we just made a world event happen with this air, you know, so and how do we yeah. minimize that and, and make it more objective for these kids to say, Hey, I do, I do have some work to do. And, and, and a parent to say, I do believe that you are, are going to be a good player and, and having these kids learn that it's a progression uh, of, of getting there. Yep. How do we, how do we, how do we, how do we get that? How do we get ourselves to do that? Well, I keep using the term lens, but it is. It's like we've got to take off this whole this whole lens and then put on a brand new lens and look through a different place, which is, am I making them a better person? And am I making them want to come back next year? And uh, putting our sole focus on that, if you're if you're giving them consequences for um, for making physical errors, they're going to despise that game. Whatever game they're playing, they're going to despise it. Uh, if you're giving consequences for choices and 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 paying attention and the character, um, now that's where I, I I come in big time and and I start at a very young age when they're three years old and they start at my beginner sandlot. If they're not giving me uncomfortable eye contact, I'm going to let them know. Obviously, in a way that is um, not going to push them out of the game because I'm looking through that lens. I I better bring them back next year because of me. They're going to come back and play next year. Uh, they've got the fun coach and they know that and they go home and they tell their parents that you need that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, giving a child a con uh, I'll give you a perfect example at my sandlots. Anytime somebody strike it, strikes out, gets out, uh, makes an error, the whole team comes over. And during COVID we, we give elbows, everybody gives an elbow and says, Hey, get him next time, kid. Mm -hmm. That kid is still crying after 15 people come over and give him an elbow and say, you're the man, get them next time. It's okay. I've made mistakes too. They're still crying. They're very sad. They know they made a mistake. They don't need to be told and narrated by eight other people uh, and commented upon, you know what? You messed up. You messed up. You messed up. You didn't do it right. Da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da. We worked on this yesterday. You didn't. They don't need it. All right. You, you have to overload the positivity and then the coach, not 12 parents, not, not the bleachers, but the coach when the time is right has to calmly come over there to, to the child and say, Hey, I've struck out five times before in a game. Let's talk about why it happened. And then boom, you can start to really dissect it and get in there. But uh, uh, yeah, you, you have to, you have to create this vibe that, uh, striking out is okay. Being afraid of striking out is not okay. Uh, and you know what, we're all gonna, gonna lift you up every time you make a mistake and then we're going to figure out, uh, how to do better. Now it could be, they're not listening when, when you teach them, right? Maybe they're not paying attention and then there's a consequence there. And sure. for them, the consequence is right in front of them. They struck out. 
you will have a percentage of the kids just not even care uh, because they don't want to be there. And that's why one of the first things I teach any coach is to connect with your players, give them a nickname based on something they love, uh, find out what they eat for breakfast, what makes them tick, what gives them joy, um, what makes them bored. You got to find this out uh, along every single child on your dugout because there's going to be three or four different types of kids. You'll have the beginner that loves the game. You'll have the beginner that doesn't want to be there. You'll have the advanced that's too cool for school. You'll have the intermediate that hustles all over the place. Mm -hmm. So, um, so in a way you are a therapist that dealing with right. a lot of different personalities and coaching the person is, uh, is enough. Uh, as far as coaching the player, I don't go there till, till they're uh, definitely growing facial hair. Uh, you know, and, uh, and, and old enough to, to really understand, okay, my hands have got to move this direction and stay this close to my body and have this kind of angle. Um, uh, that's where the, the, uh, the skills can really become a little more paramount because they can do it. They can hear it and they can do it. Yeah. They, um, become, they, they don't become coachable to, to, I mean, every kid, maybe at a different age, but they don't become coachable to what they become coachable. And if they don't have the love and care, no, I listen anyway, but I like what you're saying about, you know, I think similar to being a parent, right? I've got your back and that's most important. I've been there where you're at. And there's a sympathy to that. There's a compassion to that. I'm not, I'm not perfect. So why, you know, I, I do see Phil, I, I do want to say to coach, I'd like to see you over, overweight, but get out there and feel that ground ball. I, I try not to. One of my favorite comments, anytime I see a kid strike out a couple of times, I'll say, hey, uh, this one time, January 17th, uh, 1999, struck out four times. Mm -hmm. Guess what I did that fifth time? Struck out again. <laughs> oh, for five, five Ks. What are the odds? And, uh, you know, you immediately get a smile out of the kid that's just struck out three times and perspective shines through. So, um, constant reminders of perspective. Or Absolutely. And, and the, the, it is so far the other direction right now, as far as what, what kids expect after they make a mistake that you've just got to overload this, this joy and positivity um, just to get them back to square one. Well, I like what you said though, too, because you kind of have two buckets of coaching in your, from your, from your style, which is there's the, there's the love and compassion and, and caring and, and I got your back, but there is the other bucket. And I don't, I hope that people give you credit for understanding the other bucket exists of, Hey, you know, you're not, you're not running as hard as you can. There's, there's a, there is the effort side. There is the uh, doing the work side and, and, and there's a balance of both though. Right. And, and, and they both ultimately need to be there. If you really do want to get somewhere. There uh, is a balance. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I believe the, uh, the head coach of Vanderbilt is a big believer in this. It, it, he, he says, if, if I'm creating the best person, um, then they will become their best version of, of a player. If, if, if I'm encouraging and, and teaching and molding these minds to be uh, uh, of great character and making the best choices they can, then they're going to, go that extra mile and show up a little bit early tomorrow for uh, early BP or ground balls. They're going to work out a little bit harder. Um, and if they, if I create the best person I can, and they still aren't pushed to succeed as a player, good. They're not meant to play baseball. They're meant to go do something else, right? Yeah. Because that, that, that they're not in that one percentile that, that has to have it. Because you do, you you need to have it once you get to that elite level, um, uh, and and you'll go the extra mile because your coach taught taught you to be the best person you can be. Yeah. Um, but you know, th then there comes the question: My kid is so 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 talented, uh, but I just can't get them to uh, work hard or or listen or pay attention. Well, then you've got to kind of dissect going backwards, like what, what created that? What, I mean, 
that's why I started age three. And that's why, you know, if I can be the first example to any kid of a, of a game of baseball or youth sports, and all they, all they feel is the, this sense of a birthday party, because at that age, it's just generalizations. They don't, they don't perceive specifics and dissect specifics of what a coach is. They just feel a general sense of negativity, positivity, birthday party, fun, feels like the beach, whatever. And, and, and so if I can push joy, positivity, and good choices at age three, then man, they're going to carry their own bag to the car when they're five. They're going to uh, treat teammates with kindness when they're seven. And they're going to go that extra mile and get to that early batting practice when they're 16 um, be because it sticks. It really sticks in their brain. Yeah. I mean, I think maybe that's why a lot of, it, it's really one of the most fascinating, fascinating I've learned, thing I've learned about you today is I didn't know the part about that when you started coaching, you were kind of that guy. You were kind mm -hmm. of yelling. You were, I had no idea. And I'm ashamed I, to say I, it, but I like but it. it. I like it. It gives, you, it gives you even more credibility, right? Because now you can sympathize with the guys who, I mean, I do try to sympathize with a, a young colleague, a guy that just played college ball and maybe a couple of years of minor league ball. And now he's coaching kids. And it's hard for him to see how unadvanced these kids are that just can't deal with it. And maybe, and, and you know, even then I'll translate to the dad, you know, I, I have really, really had to work at not wanting for my, for my kids what I cared about. I really told myself over and I had a, I'm a, I'm a reminder, it says, you know, it's not my job to make or encourage my kids to love baseball. It's my job to help them find what they do love and then remind them that, you know, I, I, you do tend to, pursue and work at what you love if you find it and it's not so much like hey you gotta go do this well there's a reason he's probably not doing it. he doesn't love it <laughs> and yeah. that's okay like I my, my middle son just loves football with a passion I cannot describe for myself other than fly fishing I just gotta do it gotta do it I gotta get out there and do it and I'm like that and he does still play baseball he tolerates it but I just love that he loves football and it could it could just be it could just be a personal thing that that with your child that he just loves that game and he will uh, he will go to any extent to play that game, um, but I mean my guess is the majority of kids when they have that passion at your son's age, there was a coach at an early age that made it very fun or or there it it. it uh, turned on a light bulb. There was a moment. In, in, it could have been a moment, right? A, a moment, moment where, where hey, th this this coach, it, it feels safe. It feels fun. And, I mean, for me, that was my dad. My dad never pressured me uh, in anything. Uh, you know, I'm sure he went to the bathroom and threw up sometimes because he was so nervous, and I know he did. Um, but he would always sit behind the left field fence and um uh, all he would say is positives and if it was a strikeout all right get him next time and if it was a home run well I'll see you later ball it was just all very even killed and uh he was not the roller coaster he was the, the chief, he was the he chief was chief the straight and narrow because uh, he'd been there he'd done that he knows the mind of a of a baseball player hmm. and uh he knows how how uh, we we self destruct ourselves, and we need people to build us back up. Um, so thankful uh, to him, and you know that's a big reason why I'm in love with the game now. So um, this is something that that really transcends baseball. It goes to all the sports, and and it just needs to be a message heard by every child um, to. Uh, to try to become the best person they can every day and try to find as much joy as they can every day. So I just, along the way, I've picked up different tips by listening. You know, coaching is, is listening. And I, I listen to kids' interests and, and their nicknames and what they love to do. And most kids love music, which is great for me because I do too. Most kids love um superheroes and uh, things that rhyme and catchphrases and uh, 
animal references. So uh, along the way, I've been able to teach the skills in an engaging way through things kids love and things kids laugh at when I talk about and things kids go home and start singing to their parents. And then they want to teach their parents how to throw a ball correctly and teach them this song that they learned. Um, so when I hire assistant coaches, wherever I go, I don't need the 30 year old that knows everything about baseball. I'd much rather have the eighth grader um, that's really great with kids and, uh, and is, is just going to, uh, you know, lead by example as far as hustling to different stations and, and having lots of joy and, and being very kind. Um, that's what I look for in, in an assistant coach. And yeah. as far as what skills that eighth grader is going to teach that 10 year old, well, just listen in the team meeting. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the, the vernacular and you just uh, use that same thing. Um, but it's all under the umbrella of, of positive reinforcement. And I, as you mentioned, I was not a believer in that uh, early on in my coaching career because I was one that really excelled when the, when the pressure was on or when my coach was yelling. So how about that? As a player, you, you were. As a player, you know, we, we, had, we had a pretty yelly coach in college and I thrived on it. And I don't know why. Um, I don't think it was healthy for me, but Maybe it um, ball game, if you could bottle up the why we could do, we could, we could make a lot of money here. <laughs> wow. yeah, exactly. Well, I just love that you're a recovering abusive coach. I don't, I think that's going too far, but it, it gives me hope that but it, that's the thing. It's like, I, I, I want to help the mom. I just see in such torture over there. I, 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 you know, Jake Mangum is one of our pro guys and he says, and he is the, the leading hitter, all time hitter in the SEC, which is quite an accomplishment with the history of the SEC, the most hits ever. And we have a little film where he's hunting and he says, you know, if you don't, you know, if you don't feel the pregame jitters, if you're not nervous, you don't care. And it tells me, oh, it's okay to feel nervous. Like nervousness is a part of caring. Because you don't get nervous about things you don't care about. So the nurse just tells you in your heart that you care about something that's a good thing. But we have to control that. And he has to be able to get into the game and as fast as possible, get past the nervousness and into the flow of the joy and the feeling of the game. And I get this is, this is one conversation with players, but I'm trying to stay today with how do I help mom over there do that? <laughs> how do I help coach? How, how do I... How do I help recovering um, overly aggressive coach do this? Like, how do we stay connected to the joy? Well, I because feel we like know that it unlocks the warrior. The warrior yeah. comes out when they find the joy, man. Well, for me, I feel I, I thought I was a failure as a coach because the kid wasn't performing the way I had taught them, mm -hmm. um, and I, I looked so much on the performance of the athletic act. Uh, and I, I did not, um, I couldn't understand, okay, it, th this kid's not paying attention and they're not, um, you know, fielding this ground ball correctly. Um, I'm a failure. I need to yell louder. I need to uh, scream uh, more passionately. Uh, I need We've to drive. we got to find videos I of the old coach ball game. We have to find them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and I'm probably overstating it a bit, but, yeah. but you know, if you go back and, and talk so to, where, so I thought you floated down from heaven. Right. You were no. Just no, 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 no. I came, I came from the dirt, uh, kicking and screaming and, uh, I saw the light and, uh, and, and, you know, I, I hope, I, I do think that helps, um, uh, me be, relate to a lot more people because, you know, kids are tough and it, you need a lot of patience, especially at a young age uh, to, to get here to this point where I'm at. But yeah, the most positive coach you've ever met, Coach Ballgame, uh, he, was, he was negative and passive aggressive at the start. So uh, if you're not, I mean, then, then God bless you. You're, you're in, my, in my world, that's not, that's not human. So well done. <laughs> um, so, so you're there, you're at that place of yelling and screaming and I'm just here to tell you it doesn't work 
and and uh, I can relate with you on on maybe you feel like you've failed at, at, at not getting them to that extra baseball lesson or that extra tournament or or you know buying that extra uh, piece of equipment they needed mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah it, it it's got to be flipped on its head and just kind of seen seen through uh, the eyes of the child like just try to get in their shoes get in their brain um, and listen just listen listen to the kids more uh, they'll let you know uh, you know how they feel mm -hmm. and and I mean you got to be honest the, these days that I mean the kids are sad like there are a lot of sad kids out there and and they need joy they don't need more pressure they don't need more sadness um, so it's more important than ever now to build 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 uh, them up and listen to them and find where their joy can be and uh, and yeah just looking through a different lens can really do that but I mean you know parents tell me all the time their kid listens to me and they won't listen to them and I get that firsthand now because my daughters will listen to their dance teacher. They will not listen to me at all. So, well, you're uh, a, a dancer too. So, I kind of there you go. As a coach, um, you're actually it's so important because all the kids they look up to you and and kind of listen to you and watch you more than they do their parents. Um, and that's where I can come in as a coach and and say, hey here's some homework, go do the, the dishes for your parents, go, go do some chores around the house and let them know you are a ball player. And this is what a ball player does. Mm. Um, so that way, you know, what you're teaching is, is positively affecting the family and the house and the community and the whole city. So, um, yeah, I'll just keep, I'll just keep, uh, keep telling my story to, to every town I can. So what, I'm trying to get practical advice out of this. Um, I can't walk up to a mom who's just, well, maybe I could. I can't walk up to a mom who I can just see is suffering. And, and it's what's the practical advice for her to be more like your pops? Because it's, 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 it's easy to say it to someone, but this is psychology. These are humans, the most complicated species on the planet we're dealing with that have these these brains that cause all this. So like, what's the practical advice, you know? And I, because I, because why I care is she's suffering. She feels it physically, but what's happening is my Nate, my buddy Nate Trotsky will say is that we all put up a frequency, like a, maybe a some molecular thing. I'm not a scientist. Like there's a frequency that you can feel coming out of a player who has confidence and Everybody feels like this kid's gonna get a hit. And then there's a frequency that's completely the opposite where it's like, no one in the stadium believes that anything good is gonna hear it happen. And I'm, so this, this is the, the environment that we nurture because mom also has a frequency that's sin, sin, being sent out. And I know she wants her player to do well and not fail, but that frequency is felt. And then yeah. you've got 16 parents doing this. And then maybe the coach is seeing when that frequency, that frequency is starting, you know, and I'm a sensory, I'm a, I have some sensory issues. I'm a sense, I can feel this so much. Like I have nervous uh, sensory issues. So I think maybe I feel it more than your typical person. And maybe it's uh, why it was harder to deal with, but like that frequency is real. I think, how do I get mom to, I, I she's not going to stop caring. I, I, I'm not going to say, just don't care. Like, you can't do that. She cares. It's her child. And the worst, it's hard to see your child there, but how do I help her send out a better, better frequency yet, is I guess what I'm trying to ask. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just... Is there, pill, is there a pill you could take? Is there, there, a, uh, yeah, I wish there was. <laughs> um, I, I had a good mentor tell me one time, you know, whatever team you're coaching, um, send an email uh, to the parents, clear expectations. Uh, of of what what we're going to be doing from the dugout, what we're going to be doing from the bleachers, uh, and you need to get on board with this, uh, or we're going to have to have a, a serious chat. And that is, we are about the person. We're about the character of these kids, making them the best human being they can be, and making sure that they 
that that this team is their most fun part of their week. Um, and I think most parents can read between the lines. That means zero negativity. That means zero pressure. That, um, you know, you go back to the very start where the analogy was the video games. You just let the kid be. They, they go into their room and they play the video games for hours and hours and they love it and they can't wait to do it again tomorrow. Um, so that's a great analogy to use in that email. But uh, you, you're going to have different wired parents, just like you have different wired kids. Mm -hmm. So that message might come across clear to 10% of your, your team's parents. And, you know, it, it's a lot of time that you'll have to spend talking one-on-one -on -one with each different parent and saying, Hey, oh, well. we're flipping this thing on its head. Yeah. And you know why? Because what we're doing is not working. And, um, and what is more important, this win for this 13 year old, um, because I played college baseball, I played pro baseball. I don't remember every strikeout I had or every uh, no hitter or home run I had when I was 13. Um, but I remember really fun coaches and really great experiences with teams uh, where I felt uplifted and it created this joy for baseball and joy for life within me. Um, and that's, that, that's kind of how I, I got to this place athletically. Um, but yeah, it starts in the mind. Uh, and uh, I think that's a great way to communicate is just set this clear expectation because you might be the only person that delivers this message to that parent. And, and, and the rest of the world is screaming, you better get that scholarship because college costs too much. You better try to get to this showcase. Um, and, you know, uh, because that's where the college coaches are going to watch you. The cream will rise to the top, have confidence in that. Um, but that's like fifth down the line as far as importance. You're, what I'd like to, you're not, you're not telling people it doesn't matter that, it, it, you're not saying not getting a college scholarship is a big deal. You're not saying don't make that a goal. You're not saying don't. No, no, I'm very you're optimistic saying, about it all. There's a different, more joyful route that actually might work better to get there. I mean, I'm an optimist you get there, you get there. You're an to optimist. the fullest. I'm a Ted Lasso optimist to the fullest. Ah, so I, I think it takes that kind of coach and look at him working with adults. Yeah. He wants to win, but it's not about the wins. You know, he's trying to build this team. Um, and such a great show because of that, because of how he, he looks at the heart and the person and he looks at the humanity of the humanity. Life. Exactly. So, um, uh, is it tough on a 12 year old to go? Oh, and 13, uh, in a season. Absolutely. Um, uh, but, can you, even if they go 0 and 13, uh, can they still have the best year of their um, young adult life? Uh, yes. If, if you're bringing such a joy to each practice and um, you're creating, you're creating this, this bug for baseball within this kid, they'll come back next year and maybe they'll be driven because you've taught them to be a better person. They'll be driven to, to play even better the next year. And then they, they go 13 and zero, um, and that's great too, <laughs> but oh, and 13 and 13 and zero, um, it's, it never even really comes into my brain. You know, who cares? Who cares? Who cares? I keep thinking about your four strikeout. I'm sorry, your five strikeouts. I didn't mean a short, short play. But I'm no, it was five. I'm your dad or your coach or your mom. And I'm like, okay, my parents learned not to talk to me. Um, my parents would not talk to me because they did not want to be talked to. And uh, they would also act like nothing was wrong whatsoever. And I'm not sure that that's the right tactic. I mean, maybe it's somewhere in between is if I'm your dad and you struck out five times, do I go talk to you? But what's that conversation like? Because from a human standpoint, I do as a player, I think my favorite coaches, I, they were hard on me and they, they pushed me to be the best because, but I think I always felt that it was coming from a place of they did believe me. They, they I was, did, they, yeah. that message was projected and felt, but I had a coach when I was in sixth, he's top three coaches and James Rowland, I'll never forget. It. And so 
don't see him around. And he had an uh, impact on my life because I think I was the running back on his little PB football team. And I was, I was fast. I was, I was kind of, it was a little easy for me. And one day in practice, I think he just saw that I was keeping about an 80% effort towards what I could be. And he said, come here. He said, next game, I'm, I'm making you second team. And I went, what? Uh, what? I'm the, I'm the guy. And of course, he knew what he's doing the whole time. And when he put me back in, boy, did I run hard like never before. And that's, that's, the, that's the other bucket we're talking about that is the, the consequences part that that needs to occur. But he did it because he's like, I love this kid, but he can do better than this and he knows it. And I'm going to show him that he knows it, but he's got to find an insult to do that. Yeah, um, no, it's great. I, I, but but when he when he when I struck out four times, what would that conversation be like from a coach like that? What what should that come? Should should mom talk to Johnny after that and and just listen? Is, is that as simple as it's just listening to what you're going through? Yeah, I mean, most kids are very hard on themselves, and I was too. Yeah. When I struck out four times or five times, or I made an error, I was defeated, especially at, at an early age, eleven, twelve. 13. I was defeated. Defeated so, is a good word. So there is zero words that, that would help me in that moment mm -hmm. that would feel uh, genuine. Um, but my dad would, uh, would give me a hug. And that was it. That was and, it. Uh, and, was then, the and then my coach might come sit by me and, uh, and say uh, a, a funny joke. Bring back, um, bring perspective back to things, maybe. And that would calm me down. Um, I, I mean, I, and I think I'm in the my majority there as far as a kid striking out a bunch or, or making an error and, and beating themselves up and being defeated. So, I mean, you got to, you, you, you you just got to, I think, as a coach, quiet that voice within that child that's wanting to just be defeated, you know, and maybe that's, that's just, that just kind of slow things down. For Hopefully them. he does realize you're that way because you do really care about it. Again, you wouldn't, exactly. you wouldn't be beating yourself up if you didn't care about it. And, so let's and, work with that. And me having so many struggles with the game of baseball and, and, and losing many games and hitting eight people the first time I pitched, literally hit eight straight guys because I didn't know where the ball was going. And then telling that to a kid that just hit a kid and now that pitcher is defeated because they don't want to hurt somebody else and letting them know this, um, you know, you're still seven behind me as far as, as, as hitting batters. So you're way ahead of me. And I, I think I'm pretty good at baseball. So um, coming in with that calm, calming voice. Um, I always think of Dan Patrick. He, 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 he'll comment on, on worldly issues and he always has this fatherly calm voice. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it is, it calms, it calms me down. And, and that's where I try to come from in that place. And there are, there are times when I'll just ask another player, cause I see a kid, at the end of the dugout slouched over defeated. And I'll, I'll tell one of the other players, Hey, go tell them about last week when you struck out three times and, uh, and they'll perk up pretty quickly. But you, you say you have those sense sensory things. I mean, I'm, I'm multiply that times three. I feel everything and I, I hear everything and I sense everything, every emotion from every child. And I think that's something that you build over time um, because if I would have been sensor, sensing all of those emotions when I first started out, I wouldn't be as, uh, as negative or passive aggressive as I was. So um, yeah, all the failures I've made as a player and as a coach, uh, they, uh, they make the message I have now so much deeper um, and worthwhile. So uh, I guess I'm glad I went through it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you have a great perspective that your challenges are gifts from, the, you know, the gifts that, that we see them as gifts and we, are, we try to be joyful that I'm going through this challenge because it's going to make me better on the other end. And I tried it as a dad, I think, tried to, being a dad is 
not easy. Nope. Hardest thing it's like ever. A perfectionist or something, but it's like, you know, there's a couple things I'm proud of. And I'm like, you know, I look at my 17 year old and I think that kid has learned to take care of himself. He's, he could go live on his own right now and, and be okay. And, and that's really my job as a parent for them to be able to stand on their own two feet and, and, and get through things. You know? Yep. So are we building through positivity better? I mean, we do want that kid when like, let's say there's a kid that, that, that you coach from five to 12 and he, he does get himself so good that he goes to UCLA and maybe old UCLA coach is the most crotchety old guy who just only uses consequences for everything have we developed through positivity a kid that can go mentally deal with that i mean that with that and i'm being devil's advocate right here i'm saying there's a coach that's looking at coach ball game and say well this isn't going to build this kid into this warrior mentality where he can go deal with that coach but yeah. but what would you do you think that you can do that through positivity? yeah i'd i'd say to that person well, you haven't come to any of my camps or you haven't mm -hmm. seen me coach in person because I am a stickler for, uh, for good choices and I'm a stickler for paying attention and I'm firm when I need to be, when a, um, a kid is just, uh, mailing it in, so to speak. Uh, and, uh, there is a, f a very nice balance that is necessary. Um, because if I just was fun coach, if I just, that's all I did was fun, fun, fun. If I only looked through that lens and not also building character, I mean, kids would be climbing fences and, and, and talking during team meetings and making bad choices. So no, I, I uh, as, as much weight as I put into making it as fun and memorable as I can, I probably put more. And I think all the parents that come to, uh, the sandlots and sit there in their lawn chairs and watch, they would attest. Um, it's more about character. And, okay. um, and, and I mean, when they run into different personalities, as far as coaches go, they've learned to respect their coaches. So they're not going to, you know, they're not going to uh, be negative about it, but that, I think that's where good parents come in and, and they can, marinate and mold that situation as they see fit. Um, but hopefully by the time they get there, you've built a great, strong, obedient, respectful, uh, joyful person. And you know, that, that breeds maturity and maturity can handle, uh, the yeller, I think, uh, and, and can honestly, um, in a way teach the coach and and yeah. and i get that i get kids that teach me I, I want people to understand that that's your that your message isn't that your fun and fun is your tool but your your mission is building character i think that fun is the tool maybe um, yeah, well i i i i think i think you're you're totally right i i try to um i try to make the the feel uh and when you walk away like got to come back next, next time. I, I can't, I mean, that was the best part of my week. It was very fun, but without them realizing it, I've taught them the skills of the game and I've, I've built their character. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, the overwhelming sense walking away is fun, but when you dig deep without them realizing it, um, I just, I just got them to go do some chores in the, at the house, you know, and I, I got them to, I got them to, um, be able to, to bat, uh, uh, work a little bit harder on that science test, um, to, to maybe prepare and make an A instead of a B, uh, without them realizing it. Well, and I'm not here to in any way promote Warsic, but I love that you've supported us and you work like the battle share and there's something about the warrior and I, it, it's similar. I don't want people to think that when we say warrior, we mean you're, you know, you're brave heart. It, it's not the physical part of the warrior that we're impressed with. It's the mental part of the warrior, the sympathetic yeah. part of the warrior that goes defends. You know, if a kid's getting bullied, the warrior could step in there 
and, and put his own self in danger or whatever. Like it's these, it's these hum, human attributes of virtue that, yeah. that you can have to go, you know, make yourself a better human. Which well, that's what's great like about war stick. Yeah. You go, you, you go way deeper than, than the sports and you also um, have a way of marrying art and, uh, and sports, which I'm just a big fan of. You do too. And you're a national treasure. And ah. keep going. Ah. Well, and I, I probably should wrap it up because I think it's been about an hour and, and uh, I could talk to you all day, but I want to save, save it. And I've loved it. Loved every second. And I'm um, hoping that I'm going to go maybe this convert, this topic is really interesting me to, to start focusing more on the coaches and the parents. Um, Cause I, it's the players. I, I, I'm like, well, another way we can help the players is maybe help the coaches. And the parents. <laughs> so yep. um, I appreciate the, the insight in there. And I'm maybe going to, I don't know. I feel like maybe this has inspired me to do a series where maybe I talked to a zoom with five youth coaches about how do you help the kids deal with failure? And I want to see how that's done in high school and then college and pro, because it's going to be different, different perspectives. And I'm, I'm just interested in, in that. But I was like, there's one place to start from the beginning. Go to game. 100%. <laughs> You're, You're the, the leadoff hitter, man. You're the leadoff hitter. I love it. You go, we go. All you right, go, man. we go. Lead off batter. All right, James. Well, I'm going to see you down the road soon, man. Stay good out there in California. All right, brother. All right, man. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.